been talking about Jesus Christ. He is the faithful God, the Lord God of glory who came into our world among us to die for our sins, be buried, and was raised again. And so today I want to talk about tonight the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's, we've alluded to this already, but when he died, he paid the price for our sins. When he was buried, that was the the final act, it was finality to his earthly life, so to speak. He was truly dead, it was over. But then when he rose from the grave, he won the victory. Praise God. So let's talk about that. Why do we believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Of course, it's a matter of faith. You can't prove it scientifically because it transcends science. You can't prove it historically uh, because it would transcend our ability to record history. Yet, our faith is not uh, a superstitious faith. It's not a blind faith. It's a very reasonable faith. It makes sense in light of the evidence. Let's talk about that just a little bit. How do we know that Jesus rose from the dead? I want to give you at least five major evidences. First of all, the record of the empty tomb. The Gospels record that the tomb was empty. Now, if this were merely a fairy tale, the critics of Christianity would have refuted it. They would have said, here's the tomb, here's the body. That disproves it. If his body had been stolen, they would have recovered the body. But if you notice in Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, it says that there was a great earthquake. An angel of the Lord descended, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. And the guards went into the city and reported all these things to the chief priest. Now recall that when Jesus was buried, uh, that... He was placed in a tomb, stone was rolled into place, which one person could not move. It was sealed, and then guards were placed around the tomb. And I think it's ironic, because the Jewish leaders said, you know, we heard this rumor or this saying that he would rise from the dead, and so probably his disciples are going to try to steal his body and make that, uh, you know, make people believe that. And so because of this uh, concern, they convinced the Romans to place guards. And so the irony is the very thing they were trying to prevent, they proved. If there had been no guards, if there had been no seal, if there had been no stone, uh, you could have said, well, uh, somebody just came in the middle of the night and stole the body. But that false uh, statement can't stand up because of the very way that he was buried. The fact that the tomb was empty and nobody could dispute it. They tried to create excuses. After all, the disciples stole his body. But if you if you look at the record of the disciples, they weren't uh, uh, bold enough to overpower the Roman guards and risk their own life by stealing his body. To the contrary, even after the resurrection, they were hiding behind locked doors, afraid that they would be arrested next. And so there really is no other explanation for the empty tomb except the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul wrote in the A.D. 50s and 1 Corinthians, uh, he listed ten different... Uh, well, Paul didn't list all of them this way, but if you look at the gospel accounts, there are ten different appearances to various witnesses. But Paul specifically pointed out that one of those appearances was to over 500 witnesses at the same time. 1 Corinthians 15, 6. It says, After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So Paul writing, uh, perhaps 25 years after these events, and he's, he says he was seen by, by various people, including over 500 at one time, and most of these people are still alive. Now notice how powerful that is. If that was simply a lie, then that could have been easily refuted. The people were alive who could have been interviewed. So when you have many witnesses, 10 different occasions, and one of those occasions over 500 people, how else do you explain the story of the resurrection? And then if you look at some of the individuals, the brothers of Christ did not follow him during his earthly ministry. Uh, they didn't believe on him. You can see the example in John chapter 7. His brothers thought he was crazy. 
uh, his brothers thought he was exaggerating. And in uh, John 7, 5, it concludes, For even his brothers did not believe in him. And all throughout his earthly ministry, you don't find his brothers following him. But in Acts chapter 1, after Jesus ascended to heaven, a group of people were waiting to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.14, that included Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. What changed his brothers from thinking he was crazy and foolish to following him and seeking the Holy Spirit? Well, they saw the resurrected Christ. And one of the people that Paul specifically mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared to his brother James. Now think about it. If you had an older brother, and perhaps you admired him, but might have resented him, sibling rivalry or whatever the case. But if your brother, if people went around saying, I think your brother is the Messiah. I think your brother is the Savior of the world. You would probably say, I really love my brother and all that, but there's no way. I just can't see that. But if your brother died, if he was crucified, and you saw that happen, he was placed in the tomb, you saw that happen, you attended your brother's funeral, and then three days later, he appeared to you personally and said, hey, I'm back. That would make a believer out of you. Now, you can fool strangers, but you can't really fool your own brothers. And so the reason why they became his followers, and James uh, was one of the leaders of the early church in Acts, the book of Acts, it's because they saw their brother resurrected from the dead. Amen. And then uh, we also not have the example of the disciples themselves. Let's see if I can get this thing to work here. What's happening? Okay. I alluded to this already. But throughout the Gospels, you see a picture of disciples who didn't really understand. Jesus tried to explain, I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to die. No, don't do that, Lord. But don't worry, I'll rise again. Well, that, that didn't even make sense to them. They never got it. And so even up until the crucifixion, they were trying to figure this all out. And then when Jesus was crucified, everyone fled. Peter, who was probably the most prominent spokesman, the most vocal and visible of the disciples, he denied the Lord three times and even cursed and used oaths. John was perhaps the only one of the twelve who actually was at the cross. It seems the others were too afraid to get too close because they thought they would be arrested. And as I said, after the resurrection, before they knew what was going on, they met, they were hiding, and when Jesus appeared, their first reaction was fright. They were scared to death. So here you have people that ran from trouble, that denied the Lord with oaths, lest they be uh, uh, arrested alongside of him. But then after the resurrection and ascension, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. When they were threatened to, uh, by the religious authorities, they ignored it. The same apostle Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than man. They were arrested. They were beaten. In fact, eventually they were killed. Now, I can understand if you had some myth or some fairy tale or some money-making scheme or you were attracting a crowd, you might lie or, or fudge the truth or whatever. But when somebody says, we're going to put you in jail, somebody says, we're going to cut your head off, are you still going to confess what you know to be a lie? When all you would have to do is say, well, by the way, I made that up. Or by the way, that's a rumor. Or by the way, I didn't, I don't know that personally. That's just somewhat what somebody told me. For them to risk their lives, they believed in what they were saying. And the dramatic change in the apostles themselves is one of the most powerful proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because even their opponents said they've turned the world upside down. They transformed their world by the power of their message. If it was something they knew to be false, how would they have had the courage, much less the spiritual strength and anointing, to do what they did? And of course, uh, perhaps for, personally for us, 
the greatest witness of the resurrection is the Spirit of Christ in our hearts. Now think about this. When we come and pray and we say, in Jesus' name, We've been filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. There's a miraculous sign. Not only that, but we feel the presence of God in our hearts. The, the, uh, the love of God floods us. The joy of the Lord fills us. We pray for the sick in the name of Jesus. They're healed. We encounter demonic forces. We rebuke them in the name of Jesus. They flee. People in bondage with various sins and addictions. We pray in the name of Jesus. They are delivered. Now, is there any other example in history? Do people pray in the name of Muhammad and have miracles take place? Do they pray in the name of Buddha and miracles take place? Do they pray in the name of Joseph Smith and miracles take place? No, that doesn't happen. Even those that say they pray to saints and whatever, they're, they're really basing it on Christian belief. I guess what I'm saying is, and not just people's imagination or fables, but actually seeing someone healed and raised up. Actually see and hear someone speak in tongues. What other name has that power? If Jesus were dead and gone, there would be no reaction to praying in the name of Jesus. You would not be able to encounter the presence of God. Now, I read sometimes that people try to go back and recover the original pronunciation of God's name. And some will go back to the Old Testament and try to come up with Yahweh. And, and uh, some will try to come up with Yahshua and so on. And they'll try to make this thing that unless you learn ancient Hebrew, and unless you pronounce it the very same way the ancient Hebrews pronounced it, you're not using the name right. Because they say Jesus is an English pronunciation, which that's true. But... When you read the New Testament, it was written in Greek. And the people who wrote, the, the apostles and who wrote the New Testament Greek, they did not try to transliterate and use the Hebrew pronunciation. They used the standard Greek alphabet, Jesus. And when you're preaching in Spanish, you say Jesus. In English, Jesus. Korean, Yesu. And, then, and so on and so forth. But here's the thing. When you pray for the sick, whatever language you're using, God still answers that prayer. That lets me know it's not the technicality of what language or how it's pronounced in that language. It's through faith in who He is and calling upon Him according to your own language and your own understanding. The fact is, God answers prayer in the name of Jesus in whatever language you use. To me, that's the most powerful proof today in the 21st century of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What other name? You know, it's like Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He said, whoever's God, let him answer by fire. So the prophets of Baal... 450 of them, they prayed all day. They cried out to Baal. They got in a frenzy and they began leaping and dancing and cutting themselves, letting the blood flow. Now, if it's just a religious experience that's a hallucination or that's an emotional experience, they would have had whatever religious experience that could be generated by human emotion and human ingenuity and human imagination. But... They weren't just looking for an emotional experience. They were looking for fire to fall from heaven. And the last time I checked, no matter how emotional you are, you cannot make fire fall from heaven. No matter how much you hallucinate, you cannot make fire fall down and burn up a sacrifice. And Elijah got a little carried away. He said, well, well maybe he's sleeping. Why don't you call out loud and wake him up? Maybe he's on a journey. You've got to get his attention. Maybe, maybe he's busy. He's, he's preoccupied. Keep calling more and more. At the end of the day, finally, Elijah said, Now, God, I'm calling upon you. You're the one that told me to do all this. And I, I'm just doing what you told me to do. He says, I'm calling on you, uh, Lord God, the one true God. Show that you're God. And fire fell from heaven. Not only burned the sacrifice, but burned the altar and the water that was all around the altar. And God demonstrated who he was. I think the modern day equivalent of that would be come to the house of God and here's a bunch of sick people. Here's a bunch of needy people. Here's a lot of people discouraged and depressed. Here are marriages falling apart. Here are people that have no hope. We start praying in the name of Jesus. Somebody receives the Holy Ghost. Somebody gets joy. Somebody gets healed. Somebody is emotionally lifted up.
and we see miracles one after the other take place. But go to some other temple and you will not see anything like that. You will see people walk in with problems. They're very sincere, but you see them walk out with the same problems. I've been around the world in many different religions and I'm not disrespecting them, but I'm saying they're human attempts to find something. But there's no visible change. They walk into their house of worship. They go through the ritual. They walk out and they're just the same. Their life is not changed. Their attitude is not changed. Their spirit is not changed. And I'm saying that's what God demonstrates the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is that He's still alive. He still changes lives. He still saves. He still heals. He still delivers. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. And so, the Spirit of Christ dwells in us. And Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ is not lying in a tomb. Christ has risen and His Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts. Amen. Now let's move on. What is the true significance of the resurrection of Jesus for us? And I've touched on this in various lessons and even already tonight. But let me give you six main points. The first thing, the resurrection validated Christ's unique claims and teachings. Now anybody could say, I'm the Lord, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Savior. But that doesn't make it so. In fact, there are a lot of people through the centuries and even today who claim to be Messiah or Christ or and there are a lot of followers who claim that of them There was a well-known preacher called William Branham and some of his followers thought he was the the latest Incarnation of God or of Jesus Christ when he was tragically killed in a car wreck and uh, died I think sometime in December uh, They kept his body until Easter They kept it three days thinking he would rise on the third day when that didn't happen They kept it till Easter hoping he'd rise on Easter that didn't happen They finally buried him so a lot of people can think someone is the Messiah or the Savior But that's a lot different from proving it But when Jesus rose from the dead that showed this is not just bragging this is not just boasting This is not just superstition and supposition, but I can back up what I say There's no one else in the history of the world that's been able to raise himself from the dead praise God and so Jesus uh, Through the resurrection God proved who Jesus was Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power According to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from of the dead So how do we know that Jesus is truly the son of God because he was raised in power though? He's declared Before the whole world who he really is our God manifested in the flesh. Amen not only that, but his resurrection proclaimed God's acceptance of the atonement. We know that uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. We know through a study of the Old Testament that there had to be a sacrifice. But how do you know the sacrifice is accepted? Well, in the case of Jesus, his supreme sacrifice is accepted because God raised him up. In other words, God saying, I accept the sacrifice of Christ for the sins of the world. If he had not arisen, we might truly wonder, did the sacrifice do any good? Was it really a perfect sacrifice? Does it really cover my sins? Can it really deliver me from death? We don't have to wonder because God has already proved, yes, this sacrifice can bring someone back from the dead. I accept the sacrifice. Praise God. Then... The resurrection proclaimed, and, and I've got the scripture there, uh, but I'll just keep going. It proclaimed the gospel message. And I've used this verse several times, this passage, 1 Corinthians 15. But the culmination of the gospel message, the good news, is that he was raised, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what set the gospel in motion. The gospel, that word means good news. It's the resurrection that makes the good news good the proclamation of deliverance through Christ comes because of the resurrection amen and the resurrection destroyed the power of death and the devil I use I've used this before in Hebrews 2 
But until Jesus arose, you could still say the devil had people in his grasp. Those who died, they were waiting for deliverance. They were waiting for uh, eternal life to be fulfilled, but they didn't actually possess it. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he was the first. And as I taught in the last lesson, he brought captivity captive. He delivered the righteous souls of the Old Testament who are waiting for deliverance. And he brought them into the presence of the Lord. So for the first time since Adam and Eve, the devil's hold upon people was broken. And that was by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise God. And, of course, the resurrection of Christ imparts new life to us. We receive his spirit. So we don't have to wait until we die or until we go to heaven to start participating in new life. But we have new life in the spirit beginning right now. We have a foretaste of heaven, the earnest of our inheritance, the first fruits of the great harvest. Romans 5.10 it says that we are reconciled to God through the death of His Son much more. See, salvation is not only forgiveness of past sins. That's just the beginning. Much more we shall be saved by His life. Now, the Christian groups that focus on the crucifix or on the death, they're missing half of the gospel. Now, I appreciate anyone who proclaims that Jesus died for our sins. But just focusing on that misses the half the message. Yes, he died for our sins to forgive us. But if that's all that happened, we're still left in the same condition. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to keep on sinning. But he rose again to give new life. So not only do we have the forgiveness of sins, but we have new life in Christ. So we preach repentance from sins. We preach baptism in Jesus' name for the washing away of sins. But that's only half the gospel. The other half is receive the Holy Ghost. Receive new life. It's a new beginning because of the resurrection of Christ. Praise God. So we're buried with him in baptism, but what's the purpose? So that just as Christ was raised in the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. Amen. And, of course, because of his resurrection, then we have the promise of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 2. Uh, chapter 8 and verse 2. And then also verse 10, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, not only so, but not only spiritual life, but the resurrection of Christ also gives us assurance of future bodily resurrection for us. So if Christ was the firstborn, so to speak, if he's the elder brother, if he's the example if he's the first fruits, then that means we are going to follow in his footsteps. So not only do we have new spiritual life, but we have the promise of new bodily life, a resurrected, glorified body. So Romans 8, 11, you know, verse 10 says that when we have Christ, we have the spirit of, of life. We have um, the spirit is life because of righteousness. But then the next verse, 11, says, But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised up Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we have the hope of the resurrection. This life is not the end. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Now Christ is risen from the dead, has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits is a term. When you have a harvest, you always have some of the fruit that gets ripe early. It's not the majority of the fruit, but there's a little bit that gets ripe. So Jesus is the first in the harvest, but then we are to follow in that harvest of resurrection. First Corinthians 15, 23, but each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. And that's us. That's our hope. Now, let me make a point here as well. Not only did Jesus Christ rise bodily from the dead, but he also ascended bodily into heaven. 
Now, we won't go into a long discussion of heaven. That's another lesson. But let me just say, heaven is wherever the presence of the Lord is and wherever God's manifested presence is. We know God fills the universe, but his manifested presence. Jesus ascended out of this world into a spiritual realm, and he is bodily present in some place. He is bodily coming back to this earth. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new city called the New Jerusalem, and that will be heaven because Jesus will come down to dwell in that New Jerusalem and that new city which it seems will be on this earth or maybe it will be hovering over the earth, whatever the case may be, it's going to be a physical place that we know of as heaven. Jesus will live there bodily and we will live with him. He ascended and he is coming back the same way. It's important to understand this. Acts chapter 1 verse 9, here is the story of the ascension. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, so the disciples are watching, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So these are angelic beings who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, there is a bodily a resurrection and ascension. There is going to be a bodily return. So if someone tells you Christ is spiritually present and that's all, they are missing the truth of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because just as they watched his body ascend up into the clouds, the atmosphere, heaven, in the first sense of the word, and eventually disappear from their sight. So one day, Jesus Christ is going to come back out of the clouds and descend to this world. Now, that's the future hope of the church. That's the resurrection. That's the catching away of the saints. That's the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ back to earth. Now, when he ascended to heaven, That inaugurated a new era in human history, and that is the age of the Holy Spirit. You can see this in the ministry of Jesus himself in John 7, 39. But this spoke, this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So even though people throughout the ages felt God's presence, God led them, God guided them, God would anoint them at particular times, God would anoint the prophets to speak, and so on. Uh, God would anoint the priests as they ministered. In that sense, they felt God's presence. God's Spirit worked in their lives. But God did not pour out the Holy Spirit in the way that we enjoy today, on a permanent abiding basis, until Jesus was glorified. That means he rose from the dead with a glorified body. He ascended to heaven, a place of glory. And only then do we find the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, where people were baptized with the Holy Spirit. That is a new experience for the New Testament church. It was purchased by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, or the King James says the comforter, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit, actually his own spirit. He says in the same context, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. John 14, 18. So uh, the Holy Spirit was first poured out as a new experience, a permanent abiding relationship after Jesus ascended to heaven. His, His ascension is very significant in that regard. That inaugurates a new relationship between God and his people. You see, in the Old Testament, God used representatives. He used priests to represent the people to God. He used prophets to represent God to the people. But as far as the average person having a close, intimate, personal relationship with God, that was pretty much unknown or very difficult. Uh, But after the ascension, now, now even in Christ's earthly ministry, he was there in a very special way to those followers. But 
they could only relate to him while he was physically present. So if he was out of town, they couldn't talk to him. And so actually what we experience now is even greater than during the earthly ministry of Jesus. Because it's not limited to the flesh, but wherever we go, we can feel his presence and we can talk to him. Amen. And while you're in North Austin and you're in South Austin, we can both talk to him at the same time. So it's greater than the Old Testament in that each individual can be like a priest for himself or herself and go to God personally and directly. It's greater than the earthly ministry of Christ in that it's not limited by space or time or flesh, but everyone instantaneously, no matter where we are, has that direct relationship. Now, Jesus actually explained this. He said in John 16, 23, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. What he was telling the disciples, you know, right now, you say, we're hungry, Jesus. Do you have any food? Uh, Jesus, uh, my mother-in-law sick. Can you heal her? So everybody's asking Jesus. He says in, in, in the human sense, earthly sense, he said, in that day, you won't have to do that. You won't have to go find me. So where's Jesus? Is he in town tonight? Is he sleeping in the bottom of the boat? Where, where is he? You won't have to do that. You'll just pray to the Father. And that is pray to God in the name of Jesus. So he's talking about a new relationship. And the Spirit of Christ will be actually within us. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And then the passage that I mentioned briefly and John 14, 16 through 18, I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper. Now, sometimes that language throws people. They say, well, this is another person, another God. No, he's trying to emphasize this is a totally different relationship. Stop thinking in physical, fleshly terms that you're going to have to go find me somewhere. It's another relationship. But then he explains this further, this helper or comforter, that he may be abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you. So indirectly saying you already know him, he's here. But here's the difference, he dwells with you and will be in you. So this helper, this comforter, is going to be Jesus Christ himself, but in another relationship or another form. In other words, not in flesh, but in spirit. Not dwelling with them, limited by physical location, but dwelling in them, available at all times and all places. But then he makes the connection so you won't misunderstand. Verse 18, he says... I will not leave you orphans. That's the literal meaning of the word. I will come to you. So now he says plainly, I'm the one who's coming. Praise God. And uh, that ties into Matthew 16, 18, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. So we have the very presence of Jesus because he ascended to heaven. Now his spirit can be poured out everywhere. If Jesus were physically located on planet Earth, we'd all be trying to go to Jerusalem to find Jesus. We'd all be on a pilgrimage. And only those who had the time and the money would get to talk to him and see him. But instead, he's ascended to heaven so that he can be immediately available to everyone. And we would understand that. Praise God. Now, I'll just mention something real briefly in passing if you're interested in it. Right after Jesus arose from the dead, Mary Magdalene was the first one to see him. And she tried to grab him and hold him. And he said in the King James, oh, don't touch me because I haven't ascended to the Father. And some think that, uh, that maybe there was a secret ascension to heaven right then. I don't think that's really required by the language. What I think we understand in the uh, Greek, the present tense is always continuous. And what he was really saying when Mary tried to grab him and hold him, he said, don't keep holding me. Don't grab me. Don't hold me back. I have to ascend to my father. I'm in the process of transformation. What he was trying to tell her is, it, the relationship with my disciples cannot be like it used to be. Where I'm walking with you every day. You know, we're sitting down and talking. Uh, you're, you know, 
like John leaned against his breast at the Last Supper and asked him questions. You're not going to be able, don't detain me because I'm in the process of changing the relationship. It will not be the old relationship of communication according to the flesh, but it's going to be a new relationship of communicating with me according to the Spirit. The reason why I think that, if you read a little bit long, later, some of the when the other women found him, they fell at his feet and grabbed his feet. So it wasn't that they couldn't physically touch him. And then later, he reached out to his disciples and said, handle me and see, you know, touch me. So that wasn't the issue. It was a process. He was in a process of ascension. From the time he was resurrected to 40 days later when he bodily left the earth, he was in the process of disengaging from all of his uh, earthly relationships and transforming them into a spiritual relationship. Even his own mother on the day of Pentecost, she was waiting to receive the Holy Spirit. She understood the relationship according to the flesh was forever gone. I need a new relationship according to the Spirit. And so uh, just to, to, to uh, bring that out, John 20, verse 17, the NIV brings it out. Jesus said, and this is to Mary Magdalene, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So he's saying, you need to understand, I'm in the process of leaving. As a man, I'm going back to God. And I will assume the role of God manifest in the flesh, but from a supernatural position, a heavenly position, where you will relate to me according to the Spirit. And we do see that in Matthew 28, 9, they did hold him. They held him by the feet and worshipped him. And uh, Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, the reason why I put that in there, some people think, well, he brought his blood up to the heavenly throne at some future time. But really, I think that happened on the cross. When he died on the cross, that's when he offered himself. And that's when his blood was offered as a sacrifice of atonement towards God. That's how I understand it. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And I believe that was on the cross. I don't believe it's a later time. And I don't believe it's every time you have communion. I think it was once. And that is sufficient for our salvation. Amen. Well, there's much more that I could say. I want to talk more about the ascension of Jesus Christ. But we'll do that in one more lesson, probably next week, the Lord willing. Uh, the significance of the ascension of Christ. But what I want to summarize here tonight is, when Christ rose from the dead, he won the victory. When he ascended to heaven, that means the results of his victory are not just localized for Jerusalem for the 12 apostles, for the people that knew him physically, for the people that walked around and followed him. But that means the benefits are for the whole human race, to whosoever will, to everyone who will believe. He has now ascended and exalted. He's Lord of all. That means we all have a direct relationship with him. You see, if he were sitting in Jerusalem, you know, you might be a 1,000 miles, you might be 2,000 miles, you might be 10,000 miles, but he's in heaven. We're all the same distance. And it's really not a physical distance. It's spiritually. So by faith, we can leap over that spiritual gap, so to speak. And we can have instant contact anywhere on planet Earth. Or even if you're an astronaut and go into outer space, you're no further or no closer. You can be in the very presence of God. It's your faith. You know, the Russian cosmonauts went up there and they sent back a message saying, we've gone up here and we didn't find God. Some American astronauts went up and they, uh, they uh, read the story of Genesis chapter 1. As they saw the beauty of the earth unfolding, in essence, how could you not believe in God? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. What was the difference? Faith. One goes up looking around. Well, I can't see him. Well, you're not going to see him in space anymore. You're going to see him on earth. The other goes up and sees the incredible beauty of creation in a way that no human being has ever been able to see before. He says, wow, I'm in the presence of God. It's our choice and our faith. He has now ascended and exalted beyond any physical realm. 
if you can travel the speed of light, you still can't find Jesus until he's ready to come back to earth. But if by faith you can make contact with him right now, tonight, because he's available to every one of us. Let's stand together. The spirit of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. And I believe we ought to go to God in prayer. We've had a great move of God. I don't know how many services. We've had someone baptized, someone received the Holy Ghost continuously. And God is still drawing us here tonight. If you have a special need in your life, just come on right now. I know this is Bible study night. We're coming to a close within two minutes. I know there's a a musical practice afterwards. That's great. That's fine. But if you need healing, if you need encouragement, if you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, then why don't you come right now? Whatever you need. There are people by faith that I know they'll be glad to pray with you. Just come right on down. And as we have this closing prayer, if you want to pray where you are, and then if you want to be dismissed, you can be dismissed. But those of you, you feel like you need to touch God right now, then let's put into practice what I've been teaching, that we're in the new age of the Holy Spirit, the new era where God's presence is freely available. The Spirit of the risen Christ can touch each one of us individually at the same time. Amen. He's as close as the mention of his name. Let's pray. As you, as you sing, God bless you. You may be dismissed if you want to come and pray. Let's do that right now.